Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And as is the norm, in any given week, we have a number of important issues worthy of discussions. I want to begin by welcoming all of our viewers who are joining us on television from region number five. Welcome to another program of issues in the news. To our viewers who are joining us on television in region number six, welcome to another program of issues in the news. To all our viewers and listeners who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of issues in the news. And last but not least, to the tens of thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and even further afield, welcome to another program of issues in the news. Please press that share button on your phone press that share button on your computer, press that share button on your iPad, or whatever instrument you're using to view this program so that all the followers and friends on your wall and on your page and on your account can join us in tonight's discussion. Press that share button so that the program can enjoy the widest possible audience. I want to begin by wishing you and your family a, a prosperous 2024, a happy 2024, and may the year 2024 visit you with greater prosperity, greater success, and most importantly, good health and happiness. So 2024 is an important year. It is the year in which we have to continue, even with greater intensity, to deliver the promises which we have made to the people of our country. 2025 will be an elections year, so whatever we do in 2025 can be viewed or will be viewed by our critics as, you know, doing things for election, but this year we have to deliver on our promises. This is a very crucial year, and I want to begin on that note. I also want to extend our deepest condolences and sympathies to the family of former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Basdeo Pandey. Mr. Pandey died on New Year's Day at the ripe old age of 91. He would have led a very illustrious and distinguished career in trade unionism and more importantly in politics. He was eventually became the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago after serving in the opposition benches in the parliament of that country for decades. Mr. Pandey has now concluded his journey and I believe would have contributed significantly to the development of Trinidad and Tobago and to the politics of Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean. He was always a good friend to Dr. Jagan and the People's Progressive Party and we wish to extend to his grieving relatives, his daughter Michaela, Mrs. Pandey, grandchildren, and other relatives, our deepest sympathies and condolences. There are a couple of issues that I want to speak on tonight. And let me begin without further ado. There is circulating in the press letters that allege that the Attorney General Chambers has filed an appeal against 
a decision of the High Court to grant NIS payments to an individual. I wish to make it abundantly clear that no such appeal was filed by the Attorney General Chambers. An appeal has been filed, but has been filed by the National Insurance Scheme. The National Insurance Scheme is a statutory body corporate and can be sued and sue in its own name. There is no requirement for the Attorney General to be part of those proceedings. And the issue, as I understand it, is, and the reason for the filing of the appeal has very little to do with the monies that were awarded to the individual. Let me make it abundantly clear, because I sought information on this issue, and the information was provided. The issue in the case is that the employer, in this instance, Tulsi Passad Limited, was not made a party to the proceedings. The gentleman, through his lawyers, sued the National Insurance Scheme only and did not join Tulsi Passad Limited, his employers, to the proceedings. The NIS records show that no remissions were made by the employer to the NIS. The gentleman apparently had records which was produced to the court to show, to establish that deductions were made from his wages and or salaries. However, the NIS records do not establish that those deductions were actually paid over to NIS. And that is the problem with the case. Because we know, you know, that there are many employers who are actually deducting NIS payments from employees but are not remitting those payments to the NIS. And that is an offense. That is a criminal offense under the laws. The employers in this case should have been made a party to the proceedings. They should have been joined as a party, but that did not happen. Now, if this decision is allowed it to go unchallenged, then it would open a floodgate and of where everyone will now sue the NIS and not their employers, and NIS will have to pay. Although NIS did not receive any remissions of the payments actually made by the employees to the employers, So that is the issue. It's not about going after the gentleman's entitlement to NIS. It is about every employee now whose payments were deducted by the employers but not transmitted to the NIS will now have a claim against the NIS. And the NIS would have to pay out monies that the NIS never received for and on behalf of the employee. That is a serious problem. It will bankrupt the NIS. And those are the reasons and those are the considerations that cause the appeal to be filed by the National Insurance Scheme. So I hope that point is made emphatically clear to those who keep writing in the newspapers and alleging that the Attorney General Chambers filed some appeal. The Attorney General 
Chambers were not involved in the case at all. But because of the significance of the matter, and because I saw this thing being repeated in the press, I made the necessary inquiries. And I also read a report in the press of the case when the judge made her decision. So that appeal is intended to ventilate that particular point. Should NIS pay when NIS did not receive the money? Or should, if, if NIS is ordered to pay, then NIS will have to now go after the employers who have received the money but never transmitted or passed it over to the National Insurance Scheme. So I hope that I've clarified that point. The other point that I want to address is the contention which was so boldly carried in the newspapers that the National Resource Fund is bloated and overstated by several billions. Now, many of you would have seen my response, where I explained in very clear language, I think, that the, the National Resource Fund Act establishes that fund and the provisions of that act mandate that revenues generated from the petroleum sector by the operators of the sector are to deposit those revenues into the fund and then it will be transferred from the fund into the consolidated fund and be expended by appropriation for defined purposes. All of that are set out in the National Resource Fund Act. The revenues to which I'm making reference include taxes that oil companies have to pay. Under the 2016 agreement, most of those taxes are exempt. The same lopsided agreement that we keep speaking about. But whatever monies are payable, they must go directly into the NRF fund. And there's no provision there that allows for the payment of taxes. One section in the law provides for the payment of value-added tax, customs duties, etc. And those are being paid separately. Those are being paid to the GRA. Those are not monies that commingle and are put in the fund. They are paid directly based upon operations here in Guyana. All other monies are paid into the fund, including what the government is to get from profit oil. And I made that very clear in the response which I did. But you know, Kaichor News carried the article written by the gentleman on the front page as the elite story that the NRF fund is bloated by several billions. Front page, lead story. And when I responded, up to now, my response can't make it into the Kaicho News, although it was sent to Kaicho News for publication. So they, they publish what they want to publish. And the, the gentleman who made the allegation accused the Attorney General Chambers, the Auditor General Office, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Natural Resources, all of impropriety. 
I am the Attorney General. I am responding. And I respond on behalf of the government of Guyana as well. But my response is not published. Is that democracy? And these are the guys, these are persons who lecture you whole day and every day on the freedom of the press and the right to free speech and freedom of expression and, 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 and the, the ethics of journalism. And here it is, that they are publishing one side of the story, and when the other side responds, they do not publish the response. How can that be fair? How can that be decent? And that is what passes for journalism in Guyana. If the government is to do that, you will hear that we are authoritarian and we are dictatorial. And I just give you a classic example of how, unf how unfair and biased sections of the press are. And they are the quickest to accuse you of stifling and interfering with press freedom. Press freedom also includes publishing the views of the other side. That's the essence of natural justice and fairness. It obliges you to publish a view that you may not be in agreement with. Of course, the narrative about the NRF fund is bloated is one that suits their agenda. So they give it the highest of priority and accord it the greatest of prominence. But when the response comes, it is not accorded publication. So I just want you to understand that when these people speak about press freedom and freedom of the press and freedom of expression, you must understand how jaundiced they are. But they want to claim that they are part of a free and fair press. They are not. And I've just given you a live example of why they are not. Please Press the share button on your phone, on your computer, on your laptop, so that the program can be viewed by the widest possible audience. Please press that share button on your phone so that more and more people can be part of our discussion this evening. I want to move on now to speak about something that is making the news in the social media spectrum. And that is the service of summonses on Rickford Bork in New York. All the usual suspects have lined up to say that the service is wrong, that the service constitutes a descent into dictatorship and into auto authoritarianism. Imagine a man is accused and charged with two serious criminal offenses. And he's now being served summonses to appear in court so that he can defend himself. 
and the service of the summons now is labeled authoritarianism. I thought that if the trial proceeded without him being served and he was sentenced in his absence and denied an opportunity to defend himself and denied an opportunity to have a fair trial, I thought that those omissions will constitute a miscarriage of justice and can lend to the allegation that there is authoritarianism. Here the state of Guyana is bending backwards to ensure that this defendant is made aware of the charges and the proceedings, that he is notified of his court date so that he can make himself present either personally or through some representatives to ensure that his interest is being protected. And for doing that, the state of Guyana and the government of Guyana and the Guyana police force are all accused of totalitarianism, authoritarianism, dictatorship, and violation of the law. Can you imagine that? The man is being served. He's being notified that there are proceedings against him. <laughs> I tell you. Sometimes I believe I don't know what is wrong with people's head. I really don't know. Bork should be grateful. Well, he's not great. He should be grateful. He's entitled to that. He's entitled to be served. He's entitled as of right to be notified of the proceedings. And that's all that the state of Guyana is doing. I don't know why he's jumping like a hyena in heat. If he is so convinced that he is right and the allegations that he is making is sound or that he has not committed the offenses for which he is being charged, well then come and defend the proceedings. Why are you fabricating? Every time he speaks is a different lie. Somebody brandishing a weapon, somebody threatening him, somebody throws throw the paper in his face. And there it is on the camera. He stood up and it was read to him. And everything is on tape. Cowardice. Cowardice. It is, being, it is felt in his small little head that he can be in New York and he can violate the laws of the world. And freedom that apparently America confers upon him will protect him from all the other laws of the world. In his small little mind, that is how he sees this thing playing out. That you can stay in your basement and violate the laws of any country using the internet technology and no one can get you because you are in the great United States of America and the Constitution of America protects you. Well, we will see. We will see. And let me talk a little more about dictatorship. And I'm going to get into the summons a little later. Or rather, let me deal with that one time. Now, I've seen all sorts of legal arguments. I have seen lawyers coming up. And I am not, none of them, none of the arguments that I have seen so far, none of them points to an express provision in the law that prohibits the service of this summons outside of Guyana. None of them prohibits the service of this summons outside of Guyana. 
Some of them are saying that the magistrate has no jurisdiction to issue a summons to serve outside of Guyana. Well, I don't know that the magistrate has done that. The magistrate has simply, simply issued a summons. And let me explain something. When the magistrate, first of all, let me explain how the law works. The first question is, has an offense been committed within the jurisdiction of Guyana? That's the first issue. If yes, then the Guyana court has jurisdiction to try that offense. If the Guyana court has jurisdiction to try that offense, then wherever the defendant is, the Guyana court must necessarily have that power to bring that defendant before it. There is more common sense in that than law. So the beginning point is, does the court have jurisdiction to try the offense? Is it an offense in accordance with the laws of Guyana? And does the court have jurisdiction to try it? The offense, offenses for which Bork was served with two summonses are indictable offenses. And I'm going to explain that a little later. And they are, they relate to um, extortion extorting Guyanese. The offense was committed according to the police and their investigations within the magisterial district of Vigilance Magistrates Court. And that's why the charges were filed at Vigilance Magistrates Court. The issuance of a summons by a magistrate is not an automatic act. It is not a perfunctory act. A magistrate looks at the charge. A magistrate makes or exercises a judicial discretion to issue a summons. Having found in the exercise of her mind or his mind, when the charge come before her, that this is an offense known to the laws of Guyana and an offense for which the court has jurisdiction to try. Then the magistrate issues a summons to bring the defendant before, before him or her. It is not a sterile act of stamping and issuing a summons. So the court has already preliminarily formed the view that an offense alleged is an offense known to the laws the offense alleged in this case, and that the court has the jurisdiction to try it or try them. It is after those decisions are made that the magistrate issues a summons to bring the defendant before the court. You think that you can commit an offense against the laws of Guyana and the laws of Guyana would be so incompetent and, 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 and so impotent that we can't try you. You can just jump the country and, or don't come into the country and that's it. That's the end of the matter. The law is not an ass. The arms of the law are very long. The process may be a slow one, but it is a sure one. So none of the arguments that I've seen, none, have pointed to a provision in the law that prohibits the service of this document overseas. And that is why a police constable was present, a police officer, sorry, was present, and a process server of legal documents in New York was present. So that if the Guyanese police officer doesn't have jurisdiction over there, he has witnessed the service by an authorized service processor. And he will appear before the magistrate and say how service was effected. And he was part of the services, servicing of the document as well. 
So I see many people relying on the Summary Jurisdiction Act. Summary Jurisdiction Magistrates Act. And these lawyers, I don't know if they don't read or they don't understand law. These are indictable offenses. The Summary Jurisdiction Magistrate Court Act do not apply, does not apply. These are indictable offenses. There's another law that I refer to, that law applies. They can't even get the law right. They're going under the wrong statute. Summary Jurisdiction deals with summary offenses. This is an indictable offense or offenses. These are indictable offenses. They were not charged under this act, the Summary Jurisdiction Magistrates Court Act. So this act has no applicability. And these lawyers are writing in the newspapers and they're not even reading and understanding what they're writing. So one of them relying on this so the act that they're relying on is completely wrong. It's completely irrelevant. But let us look at what they're saying. All summonses, warrants, orders, judgments, writs of execution, or other process or proceedings, whether civil or criminal, issued or taken by the authority of any magistrate respecting any matter within his jurisdiction shall have the full force and effect and may be served or executed anywhere within Guyana by a bailiff of the court, by a police or other constable to whom they are directed, or by any other police or other constable as the case may be. So this is the section. Because it says the police or the bailiff may serve it within Guyana. But how does this, does it say that it cannot be served outside of Guyana? All this says that it, it can be served in Guyana. It doesn't say that it is the exclusive manner of service. Neither does it say that it cannot be served outside of Guyana. All this thing says is that it can be served in Guyana. And in any event, this is the wrong statute. This statute deals with summary offenses. The summonses that were served on Bork relate to indictable offenses. And that is governed by a different law. That is governed by the Criminal Law Procedure Act, Chapter 10, colon 01. And you can go in the Laws of Guyana and read it. And it says this. Every magistrate may issue a summons, and that's what this magistrate has done, or warrant, Herein after mention, to compel the appearance of an accused person before him for the purpose of a preliminary inquiry in any of the following cases. So you hear that? The magistrate may issue for an indictable offense, and that is the offense that I'm speaking about, to compel that person to appear for the purpose of a preliminary inquiry in any of the following cases. A, I will only read two. A, if the person is accused of having committed in any place, whatever, an indictable offense triable in Guyana, and is or is suspected to be within the limits in which the magistrate has jurisdiction, or resides or is suspected to reside within those limits. So if he was committed an offense and he was in the vigilance area, then the magistrate had a power to issue. Let's go on. If he, wherever he may be, is accused of having committed an indictable offense within those limits, within the vigilance magistrate court limits, or any other journey or in any part of which he has passed through or them. If he, wherever he may be, is accused of having committed an indictable offense. If he, wherever he may be, isn't that clear and broad enough to cover wherever he may be? This is the law that applies. And the lawyers were writing proof. I see one of them, a former magistrate, writing today, relying on the wrong section, the wrong law, and 
is putting a warped interpretation on the section of the law. The law is wrong in any event. It has no bearing whatsoever to indictable offenses. This is the one that deals with indictable offenses. And it says very clearly, the magistrate may issue a summons to compel the appearance of a person accused of committing an indictable offense, wherever that person may be. And the process of the law is being carried out. And the Kool-Aid gang accusing of violation of the law, the accusing of political dictatorship, the accusing of authoritarianism. And here the law is being, if a man commits an offense, you mustn't charge him. That's democracy. Nobody's charging Burke for being a critic. We have many, we have many critics against the government. Burke is being charged for committing a criminal offense. Extorting. Extortion. Where he... He told one of his confederates, who has confessed where to go and pick up the money from the businessman. And the businessman marked the money and gave it to him. And he was arrested with the money in his hand. And the man confessed. That is the evidence. It's all over in the news. And these people are talking about Dictatorship. I made some notes here of what dictatorship is or was under the PNC. When Bolanath Parmanan and Jagan Ramasar were killed by the army because they wanted the ballots to be counted at the place of poll, they were murdered in broad daylight on election day in 1973 by the then Guyana Defense Force under the instructions from the government, the PNC government. That, my friend, is dictatorship. Father Bernard Dark, a Jesuit priest, was killed in front of the Home Affairs Ministry, stabbed to death by henchmen of the Forbes Bornem administration, members of the House of Israel, Rabbi Washington and his crew, they murdered that priest because he took a photograph. The trial of Walter Rodney and Rupert Narayan were taking place at the Georgetown Magistrates Court. And this guy was a reporter and they stabbed him to death in the public's eye. That is political dictatorship. Dr. Joshua Ramsami, a WPA leader, was shot at Cornhill Street in the front of Guy Bank because he was a political activist for the WPA. That is dictatorship. Walter Rodney was bombed and blown to pieces by the Forbes Burnham administration because he was politically opposed to Forbes Burnham regime and the PNC. And Burnham broadcasted before he killed him, held a rally and says, we will know who steel is stronger. And a couple days after, Rodney was blown to pieces. A commission of inquiry that concluded its work under the PNC APNU government. It started under the PUP but concluded its work and handed over a report. A commission of inquiry into Walter Rodney's assassination. Under APNU government completed the commission of inquiry and delivered a report 
that said that the then government led by Prime Minister Forbes Barnum murdered Walter Rodney. That is political dictatorship. Ohini Kuama and Edward Dublin, two WPA activists, were executed on what is now Mandela Avenue because of their pol political work. That is political dictatorship. Vincent Tika was murdered. Prime Minister of Education murdered. No investigation. No investigation. Shirley Field Ridley died of poison and horridly cremated. Married, was married to Hamilton Green. Cremated, must ask the reason why. That is political dictatorship. And the three trials of Arnold Rampasad. Arnold Rampasad was charged with murder. Not a scintilla of evidence against him. One confession, one statement. One statement. They tried him twice for murder in Morbis. For murder, you have to have a unanimous verdict from the jury. What that means is that all 12 members must say guilty. He was acquitted twice in Barbies. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty. They tried him one time. And when the jury returned a verdict of not guilty, they tried him again. And the jury returned a verdict of not guilty again. Then they moved the trial to Georgetown. They say that he can't get a fair trial in Barbies because he's a PPP activist. And all the jury in Barbies, all the jurors are biased. They're all PPP supporters. Although they had just rigged the elections and won Barbies, they rigged the elections around that time and they won Barbies. But they say all the jurors in Barbies are PPP supporters. So the state will not get a fair trial and they bring Arnold Rampersad to Georgetown and they tried him in Georgetown and yet the jury returned a verdict of not guilty again and then they tried to kill him in the prison. They tried several times to kill him in the prison. That is political dictatorship. We are serving a summons we are serving a summons for a man to go to court who, was, who is charged with criminal offenses and we are dictators? We are dictators for complying with the law and informing the man that he has a right to come to court? Look at what, they did, what I was charged with. President Donald Ramatar issued a public statement and said, that those law books were part of my remunerative package as a minister. Was subscription the government was paying. And Basil Williams went in Barbies and held a meeting and said that I stole law books. And I sued him for libel. I sued him then for libel. And to get a defense in that libel case, he instructed Soku to charge me with larceny of those books. Today, a high court judge has ruled against him in the very libel case. And he now has to pay me $10 million. The money is running up. Interest is accumulating. I'm not bothering with it. He has filed an appeal. I'll allow him to go all the way to the CCJ. By that time, the $10 million will reach much more. And they charged me for those books. They charged Irfan Ali, the president, for developing Prado Ski, Prado, what is called Pradoville number two. Pleasance, Parendam. Cabinet 
decisions, 46 fraud charges, that is political dictatorship. Manufacturing a large charge for law books against me is political dictatorship. Ashley Singh and Brassington, they handcuff them. They handcuff them. Ashley Singh was overseas. They served the summons at his house. They never served it overseas. They served it at his house. And he had to fly in the country to, to answer the charge. And for what? For selling movie tongue, that land where movie tongue is. That was went by public tender. When they got into government, they used to hold a birthday parties right there at movie tongue. Jordan, Winston Jordan sold one of the most prized pieces of real estate on the river banks of this country. Sold a 40 million US wharf facility for 100,000 US. The charge against Dharamlal and Siraj and the GRDB. These are board directors. And, and the Kong's clerk made an entry. No money was missing. The accounts clerk did not make an entry into the accounts. And they charged those men with fraud and put them before the courts. That is dictatorship. You are comparing service of a summons on Rickford Bork in New York as dictatorship. And all that the summons says is that he must come to court. That is political dictatorship. The treason accused. They charge about four sets of people with treason. One, I remember in my Bahaika Creek, they used to lock these people up. They can't, the families can't find them. For weeks, you can't find which police station they're at. And they were torturing them to get confession statements. Today, lawyers are objecting because the police are videotaping. The police are videotaping the interviews to make it more transparent. And the lawyers are now complaining. In those days, they used to lock up those boys and you can't find them for weeks. When you find them, they already confess because they are beaten into giving confession statements. I remember the Mahaika Four. They were charged with treason because they had carbon in an oval tin. tin. You know carbon that you used to light long ago? Carbon they had in a tin which you used to shake and put a match in it and it would explode. That is what they charged the people with treason for. That was what they said they were going to blow up officer, the president or somewhere. That is political dictatorship. Today, there is compliance with the law. There is bending backwards to serve the legal process so that the man gets an opportunity to go to court and defend himself. And we are accused of political dictatorship. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. They use, look at what they did to Sarah and Soku. They use Sarah and Soku to threaten businessmen and politicians. Almost every member of our leadership of our party had to visit Soku, including Roger Luncheon on a wheelchair, Sam Hines, the Prime Minister, Clement Rohi. Priya Manik Chang, all of us, Irfan Ali, even the DPP, Shalimar Ali Haq, 
She was being investigated as well. For what? For getting a house slap from the government. If we were to reciprocate for what they did when they were in office over that five year period, I would do nothing else but deal with corruption, corruption charges. There are dozens and dozens of pieces of land that they sold without collecting a cent. Government land, state lands, to their friends and their cronies. We rescinded all those transactions. But I can, we can file criminal charges against them every day. Every day. Look at the vice president was speaking about Kathy Hughes. Receiving contracts, giving her company contracts in her own ministry, and the checks are there. The checks are there where the ministry is paying her own company. And these people are judgmental. They want to shape and form opinion. So let me, I, I, I saw the attempt to distort what the vice president said about social media influencers. I saw the attempt to manipulate what the vice president said and to allege that the vice president said that government will go after social media influencers. Look, first of all, the vice president never said so. The vice president was simply speaking about persons who believe that they are overseas and can attack others using social media platforms. If offenses are committed, the documents can be served in the wherever country they are located. That's all the Vice President was attempting to say. Is that government going after anybody? And as I have said before, government does not prosecute. Government does not investigate criminal offenses. The Guyana Police Force, a statutory body, does that. They operate under the command and superintendents of a commissioner of police. The Minister of Home Affairs can't give directions to the police commissioner in terms of his day-to-day -day activities and functional command of the force. He can only give policy directives. The DPP is an independent in constitutional office holder that advises the police in criminal matters. I represent and advise the police on civil matters. So, if one thing that the Bork service of summons will clear up is this misconception that seemed to be set in the minds of the Kool-Aid gang that the legal system of Guyana is incompetent and impotent to serve legal documents on persons who are overseas but who have transgressed the laws of Guyana or have violated some laws in Guyana. This Bork matter will put that to rest. It will put it conclusively to rest. All these arguments will have to be heard by a court. No doubt the lawyers are going to raise it and they have a right to. And whoever is dissatisfied is going to go all the way to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Or trust me, if it is ruled that the Guyana courts doesn't have jurisdiction, then I will amend the law to give the court jurisdiction to bring before the court persons who have committed offenses against the laws of this country. 
if the law or if, the, if any code rules that it is deficient or the highest code rules that it is deficient, the law will be amended to ensure that it reaches those who violate the laws of Guyana. The, system, the legal system must be able to reach them and bring them here for trial. So I thought that I would speak on those issues and bring clarity to them or bring my understanding of the issues to you and express my views on these matters that keep permeating the public domain and bring clarity on these legal matters because the Kool-Aid gang, whole day, they are at it. Whole day, lending support to alleged criminals. Because that's what Bork is. He's an alleged criminal. And if he's innocent, then come here and vindicate your innocence. Don't hide and fabricate more stories. And he says that he's talking to the FBI and he's talking to the police in New York and he has not made a report. He has not made a report because if he makes a, a report and it is false, there's another set of charges. This time by the New York authorities. So there is some method in the madness. My operator is signaling to me that we are approaching program time. I want to thank you very much for spending the past hour with me. I believe that, I hope that I have covered a lot of ground and clarified some important issues for you. And take your mind back to periods of our history where atrocities were committed by those who now want to pronounce and are the moral the moral standard bearers of today's society. Complete pack of hypocrites. Thank you very much and all the best for 2023. Until I see you again next week, take care and be good. Thank you.